things are better, better left unknown. And I'll never find you here, cause no one's ever, no one's ever Rabbit Hole is a community-driven radio. At times the community comments may reveal prejudices and other beliefs that we or our sponsors do not condone. Views or opinions expressed by the community, callers, or guests, are those of the individual speaking and do not represent the views or opinions of this site. Rippin' Common Sense content is intended for mature audiences only. Enjoy! This is My Life DIY and... Hi, this is Jojo. Hi, my name is Ash. Hey everybody, it's AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. This is Cynthia Sue Larson. This is your man Meta, aka Propagate This Light. And you're now listening to Dark Wolf's Den. The Dark Wolf's Den Show on Rippin' Common Sense Radio. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. Are ghosts real? 
We had a thousand hours of continuous communication with the spirit world. Does time travel actually exist? The laws of physics seem to be compatible with time machines. You know, sometimes I wonder about reincarnation, don't you? A four-year-old boy in Adelaide, Australia, has told his parents that he used to be Britain's Princess Diana. What would happen if the world found out that aliens were real? I didn't say disclosure would be easy, but what is the alternative? To establish a space force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. We have so many questions and yet so little time, so to have you here, the pleasure is all mine. Coming to you from a secret mountain cave hidden deep within the Idaho wilderness. This is The Dark Wolf's Den Show. Now, here is your host, Jerry Hicks. That's right, I am Jerry Hicks, also known as The Dark Wolf. And we are broadcasting live across the multiverse from a secret cave hidden high up in the beautifully snow-covered peaks of the Idaho mountains, that's right. We're ripping through the electromagnetic soup, tearing through the atmosphere, and tunneling away into your radio like a quantum particle. This is the Dark Wolf Stin Show for Wednesday, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo 2021. So whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, We're glad you chose us to be right there with you. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to dig into the Russian UFO case files. That's right, we know about the American UFO case files, but I don't think I have ever heard before now of the Russian case files. We're going to dig deep into those and find out what Russia has released on the subject. All that and more coming up here in just a moment, but first... Today in history... That's right, on this day in 1930, Amy Johnson takes off and becomes the first woman to fly solo from England to Australia. That's right, that amazing feat was conquered on this day in 1930. And that is today's Today in History. That's right. Can you believe we've only been doing flight for a little over 100 years? That is, that's insane to me, right? What what do you guys think? Almost 200 years now? Still, that's not much. And there's case files like in Russia, as well as America, that go back way, way before flight was actually invented. We, of course, know of the Aurora, Texas case file. But the Russians have a whole load of case files on their own. We're going to get into the earlier Russian case files here in just a moment, but it was very much a problem, especially during the Cold War. There were actually a couple incidents that could have risen really quickly, the tensions between the two nations. One of these incidents occurred in 1982. You see, the Soviets had a missile base in 1982 that was visited by something unknown. It was reported to be a object shaped like a Christmas tree ornament. I'm assuming it means round, of course. And it had six to eight lights around its perimeter. This object was seen by a multitude of Russian military soldiers as well as commanders and was said to have been so powerful and sent an electromagnetic beam to the ground that turned on the control systems of the nuclear missiles. If this would have went off, this could have started a very bad nuclear exchange between America and Russia, of course. And this almost did occur by reports in Russian military. And what's interesting is we also have seen UFOs over U.S. military bases that at one time they did think was Russia. Uh, because it was messing with the nuclear weapons. Now, uh, I've heard reports of them being all turned on one time. I've heard reports of them all being turned off one time. So there's been multiple cases of UFOs over nuclear facilities, both in the USA as well as the Soviet Union, apparently. And, of course, during something like the Cold War, you expect it's going to be the enemy country. 
and tensions get even higher. But when both countries are like, no, it, it wasn't us, then you got another problem, right? Well, the Russians started having problems about the early uh, early time as the Americans did. Just a little later than the Americans, but not by much. So the ufology uh, phenomenon is not uh, just in America or England or you or you know English speaking nations. It's a worldwide phenomena. Every country has the UFO phenomena, and we don't hear a lot of these other countries' case files. But tonight we're going to hear five of Russia's interesting and incredibly intriguing case files. And to bring us this amazing history this evening is a person you've heard on the channel a couple times before, the Paranormal Scholar. During the time of the Soviet Union, the threat posed by aliens was taken very seriously. So much so that under the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev, in the 1950s and 1960s, a special subunit of the KGB was tasked with the role of assessing a possible extraterrestrial threat. The task force came up with one scenario for which aliens might be interested in Earth, the exploitation and study of intelligent human life. As such, Soviet satellites, army personnel, secret agents, and many more operatives were employed to record and study all sightings of UFOs and ETs under their dominion, lest humanity fall to the malevolent influence and exploitation of an extraterrestrial civilization. It seems the Russian military and government was just as concerned about UFOs as the American one was, right? And you know, we've talked about the Aurora, Texas UFO crash of 1897, but the Russians have the mystery balloons of 1892. Check this story out. Long before the establishment of the KGB task force, unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial interference were being reported all across Russia. Early reports date to the spring of 1892, when there was a sudden outbreak of sightings of mysterious aircraft over Russian Poland and the Baltic states. And remember, the first flight at Kitty Hawk by the Wright brothers did not even occur until 1903. So this is almost a hundred years prior to any actual flying vehicle being invented by humans. One such report was made on the 26th of March, when a large balloon was spotted by Russian soldiers at the border fortress of Kovno, coming from the German frontier. Due to escalating border tensions between Russia and Germany at the time, the soldiers assumed that the balloon was an enemy unit, and so fired shots at it. The balloon is reported to have returned over the border. I find it intriguing that it went back over the border, but perhaps it just didn't mean to stray into that territory to begin with. Either way, that is an odd case file, but it's not the only one of its kind. This incident was not the first to have been reported, since as early as the 7th of March of that year, similar sightings of strange balloons were being reported on a near daily basis. By the time of the 26th of March report, encounters with German balloons as they were known at the time were regarded as frequent occurrences. And just like in America, when the airships were spotted in the skies, the reports were given to the newspapers who, of course, printed them at the time. Well, there was no difference also in Russia. A contemporary article printed in the Manchester Guardian describes how one such balloon was seen coming from the southwest near Dombrova in Russian Poland, traveling in a northeasterly direction along the railway, in spite of the fact that a northeast wind was blowing. Remember, this is 1892, and there's a balloon that is moving literally against the wind. Not only was the aircraft able to travel against the wind at a time when flight technology was limited, it was reported as having light apparatus on board. At about half past six in the evening, the balloon appeared from behind the clouds, with a light burning. So I find that a little strange. If it is German spies like they think it is, coming over in these balloons that, number one, break the laws of physics at the time, uh, because if there was like hot air balloons, it was very limited. You couldn't go against the wind like that. Uh, and equally, uh, you could also not 
really be all that wise if you're going to be carrying a light as you're trying to sneak in to enemy territory, right? Like, this has got to be the worst spy mission ever, if that's the case. All of this at a time when searchlight equipment was heavy and difficult for aircraft to carry, making nighttime flying extremely dangerous. Once again, Russian soldiers believed the balloon to be of enemy origin, and marveled at the superior technology of the Germans. On the 23rd of March, more searchlight technology was witnessed, this time in Warsaw. Reports from the time detail how many people saw a balloon over the city, casting rays of light from an electric apparatus on board. Again, if they're trying to sneak in and spy, they're really doing a horrible job of the sneaking part, right? The object remained visible in the same place in the sky until 1am, when it moved to the west. A balloon projecting powerful electric searchlights over a large extent of country was also seen near the Silesian border, where it was said to have remained motionless at a great height for as long as 40 minutes. When the balloons came near military establishments, they were shot at, seemingly with no damage being taken. Okay, a balloon moving against the wind at the time, I doubt it, but maybe. A balloon moving against the wind with searchlights at the time, now you're really getting into the realm of odd. A balloon moving into the wind with searchlights that can take bullets and bounce off of it? Okay, and for 1892, you have now officially reached sci-fi level, right? This is not any kind of technology that any of our uh, countries across the world had at that time. At least none that they've reported even to this day. As the so-called German balloons continued to be seen across Russian territories into the following month, the Russian government sought to make a formal protest to Germany about the supposed overflights, citing a breach of the military laws. Which, of course, really confused Germany, right? There was a genuine fear that German agents were being sent over the border to spy on Russia using steerable balloons, and so were in possession of technology that was unheard of at the time. And yet, the balloons were not German. We now know that Germany did not have the technology to pilot steerable balloons, let alone at night or in unfavourable weather conditions, and least of all carrying heavy searchlights. The same can be said for other countries, with routine controlled flights not being made until almost ten years later. Aside from short-lived and frail experimental aircraft, the static observation balloon was the limit of aviation technology at the time. And so, what were these phantom balloons? Where did they come from, and who did they belong to? In the century since the incidents of 1892, no one has been able to answer these questions. However, it has not stopped the skeptics from giving the same ridiculous answers that they give us here in the USA. Some have attempted to explain the balloons as a misidentification of Venus, but given the scope of the sightings, this seems highly unlikely. Surely trained soldiers and many civilian witnesses can be trusted to tell the difference between the ordinary appearance of a planet in the night sky and an irregular, moving, light-producing aircraft. What really drives me nuts about the whole Venus explanation is this is something we see come up in the sky almost every night a good portion of the year. All of a sudden, we're gonna goof up go, oh, oh no, that, that, that's, uh, that's UFO! That, 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 that's different. Come on now, we see Venus every single night, at least for half the year. And all of a sudden, no, I just, I don't see us mistaking that. That just makes no sense to me. That's why I think that is the most ridiculous answer that they could come up with. Okay, maybe the second most ridiculous behind swamp gas, right? The problem is it wasn't just this isolated cases, right? All in all, between March and April of 1892, over 100 similar reports of phantom balloons were made in Belarus, Finland, Moldova, Warsaw, and Russia. It's incredibly intriguing to me that the US wasn't the only one having these UFO flaps at the same time in history, around the 1800s. Uh, because, like I said, you know, Russia has had a couple also. 
Uh, moving forward in time to 1987, next up on our list is called the Monchegorsk Object, and I probably totally murdered that name, but uh, here we go. Let's see if the paranormal scholar can say it a little better than I have. In 1987, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev was scheduled to visit the Russian city of Severomorsk, but instead, without explanation, changed his plans and went to Monchegorsk. Kind of reminds me when, uh, I think it was Eisenhower, suddenly changed his plans and disappeared for a day or two, right? It is said that he was signing a treaty with a multitude of aliens and races, uh, but we'll get to that in a whole nother show. But again, it's interesting how it relates here with a foreign leader suddenly rushing off and disappearing for a moment. And there is a rumor as to why Gorbachev changed his flight plan. Some have speculated that this was due to a mysterious object that the military had just acquired there. The details of this object and how it was recovered are known because of a report sent to a UFOologist by a military informer referred to as B. According to their report, B and four other servicemen from the Leningrad military region were sent on an unusual mission to Northern Karelia. They were tasked with guarding a mysterious object that had been discovered on the outskirts of a town in the area. B claims that none of the servicemen, himself included, were given any details about the object, but were told that it was a UFO. When they arrived, the soldiers were supposedly able to examine the object. At first, they thought it resembled an American space shuttle. It was allegedly 46 feet long and 15 feet wide with a tan finish that felt like ceramic to the touch. There were three triangles at the fore part of the object, which were noticeable because they were a different shade of tan from the rest of the ship. This almost reminds me of the uh, cigar-shaped objects that a lot of people report. And I can tell you those triangle symbols have been reported on more than one UFO. B claimed that when they approached the object, he and the other soldiers each experienced pain. Which I find intriguing because all of the soldiers experienced the same pain, so it couldn't have been in one's head. It was clearly a, a experience that they all shared for whatever reason, so I would guess it was most likely caused by whatever the craft was. The mysterious object had no obvious way of entering it. We also hear that in a lot of case files, that the object seemed seamless and no way to actually enter or no doors or windows or any visible uh, ability to enter it, like it was all just made of one single piece of metal. He reports that, in the course of guarding the object, he witnessed specialists attempting to access the interior by using welding equipment to open it, with no effect. So it was, for a lack of a better word, impenetrable. Eventually, the strange object was moved to a locked hangar. At this point, B and the others were sent back to their military unit. He did, however, claim to have heard more about the object's fate from a military officer. Now this seems like second, second-hand information here, so let's take this part with a grain of salt. Allegedly, this officer was able to get inside the unidentified object. They described to B how the three triangles on the front were transparent from the interior. To the other officer, it was obvious that the craft had not been made for human beings, as two officers could barely fit inside. According to the story, it took a commission half an hour to figure out even the most basic of things, such as how to put their hands on the steering wheel. Unnerved by the strange craft, no one dared to sit in the chairs inside. Though this does seem like second-hand information, and I wouldn't put a lot of uh, belief in it right now, as far as this part of the story anyway, but it's one of those things that I would put in the back of my mind, and if I heard other UFO stories later that matched it, I would really, you know, uh, start to wonder if there wasn't something to the truth of this, you know what I mean? So just because you hear something second, second hand, if you will, just make sure that you kind of file 13 it, and if you find other corroborating evidence, then maybe it is true. In the course of their investigation, the soldiers managed to extricate three rods from the craft, but even with protective gear, those who handled them supposedly received terrible thermal burns. 
The strangest part of the story, however, was yet to come. According to B's testimony, a lieutenant from military headquarters arrived at his barracks to inform him and the other servicemen who had guarded the object that it had unexpectedly disappeared. The explanation that was given was that after experiencing prolonged interference with radio equipment at the hangar where the object was stored, it vanished. Huh, so after being around radio and electromagnetic frequency, it just poofed out of existence. I don't know if I buy that part. What was the object recovered in 1987? Was it an alien craft found by Soviet forces? Some do indeed think yes, with it even being proposed that the craft did not disappear, and that the story told to be was disinformation to keep the craft a secret. And that would not surprise me even a little bit. We know how much disinformation that the American government enacts itself in every day, especially when it comes to the ufology field. And I can only imagine how bad the commie Russian government would have been, uh, or even what they call their republic today still isn't as free as they would want you to believe, uh, and especially when it comes to information. So these kind of, um, of, of events where they would spread disinformation in order to try to hide the truth and, and uh, back-engineer things, well, that's exactly what the Americans seem to do too, right? They have uh, harassed UFO witnesses and done everything they can to make people look the other way while they most likely have had alien technology which they've been back-engineering for a very long time in any country. Any country in this planet would love to have some kind of super advanced technology that they could back engineer. Of course, weapons, 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 right? So, I mean, Russia would have a very, very good reason to try to hide this information, and especially lying to their own soldiers. But what do you think so far, guys? Russia's got about as many crazy UFO files as America does, right? And clearly, this is not just an American phenomenon, uh, or a British or, or any other phenomena. This is a worldwide phenomena. From Russia to Australia to Britain to America, all across the world, people experience these UFO situations and things that cannot be explained. I have heard anecdotally, a couple times actually, that Russia has downed just as many, if not more, UFOs than the Americans have. Uh, there was one report that they had literal football fields full of downed UFOs. Now, I don't know about that. Like, a lot of people argue if they've got the technology to fly all the way across the solar system or across the vast emptiness of space, how do they get here and crash? Like, really? Well, in Roswell, it's thought that it was high-grade radar equipment. And if it is, you know, you never know what you could experience elsewhere that may mess with your technology. And it could very well be the case that the radar equipment that us Earthlings happen to use happen to be in the right frequency to mess with theirs. Or at least it used to be. I, they've probably got that fixed at this point, right? <laughs> Uh, because we know now our government can't take them down, so we're pretty sure the other governments are having about the same amount of luck. But the governments of the world are worried about one thing, and that is the other governments of the world, of the world have already back-engineered these UFO craft and have an upper hand if anything were to happen in wartime, right? So this is definitely something that scares every country on this planet and is something that really... Uh, uh, gets them thinking about the possibilities of what the other countries could do because if they have a downed UFO and they've back engineered more than we have, well, what could they have? Could they have UFOs of their own? Could we have UFOs of our own? So many questions, so little time, but we're going to get back into the questions of the Russian case files right after these messages. Ladies and gentlemen, sit right there and we'll be right back. Don't you touch that dial. That's right. We got to stoke the fires and run off the men in black. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Ow! 
That's right. Your weekend has begun. Hi, everyone. It's AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. Are you enjoying tonight's episode of the Dark Wolf's Den Show? I know I am. If you are and you haven't done so already, please make sure to thumb up that video, hit that subscribe button, and ring that bell. You'll get our notifications every time we go live. We're here every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights bringing you the very best of Common Sense Radio, the Rip and Rabbit Hole. Jerry Hicks and the Dark Wolf's Den Show will return again tomorrow night with a special look at alien abduction phenomena. That's Thursday, April 29th, starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. Jerry will howl at the paranormal with all of us tomorrow night. I can't wait. I'll return then again Friday night with a special look at anticipation. Have you ever really looked forward to something, especially something that didn't quite happen on the time? table that you thought it would that's called anticipation join me friday night and we will dive through the rabbit hole of anticipation together then saturday night come along with me on a journey down the rabbit hole of small towns we're going to talk about the small towns across america the places nikki rabbit and i have been so far in small town america on this road trip and some of the places we will go then some Sunday night, a very special edition, Sunday Mothers. That's right. <clears throat> if you're a mother, or if you're going to be a mother, or if you have a mother, this uh, particular show is going to have merit for you on Mother's Day. And uh, perhaps, I don't know, it's not confirmed, but perhaps I will be joined by a special guest Sunday Mother's Day. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. However it may roam. I don't know. We'll see how the tables go, but join me for a special edition of Mothers on Mother's Day, right here on Rippin' Common Sense Radio Network, the very best of Common Sense Radio, the Rippin' Rabbit Hole. If you haven't done so already, please hop on over to therippinrabbithole.com. That's R-I-P-O-N R-A-B-B-I-T H-O-L-E dot com. There you can sign up for your exclusive backstage VIP pass. It's going to give you unfiltered access to our down the rabbit hole exclusive social media network where the backstage 24 7 vip chat lounge carries on the conversation all the time for you so join us there we'll return to tonight's topic jerry hicks and the dark will stand the russian UFO files for Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. You're listening to the Rippin' Common Sense Radio Network, the Rippin' Rabbit Hole. This is My Life DIY and... Hi, this is Jojo. Hi, my name is I. Hey everybody, it's AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. This is Cynthia Sue Larson. This is your man Meta, aka Propagate This Light. And you're now listening to Dark Wolf's Den. The Dark Wolf's Den Show on Rippin' Common Sense Radio. If you were meant to be controlled, you would have come with a remote, but you didn't. And that's why you listen to the Dark Wolf's Den Show. Now, here is your host, Jerry Hicks. That's right, I am Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. And welcome back to the second half of the Dark Wolf's Den Show for Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. Happy Cinco de Mayo! Hey! Whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, 
We're glad you chose us to be right there with you. <laughs> You're just tuning in tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We are discussing Russian UFO case files. These are case files that I had never heard before, and I'm pretty sure most of you had neither because there's not a lot of information that comes out of Russia. So finding these is truly a gem, and it's amazing to me how much alike the American case files that they are. It shows that we have the exact same phenomenon going on. And a lot of times these things are caught on radar, especially over areas that there shouldn't be any flight traffic at all. And this is what worries a lot of these countries, like in our next case file that happened around Leningrad, Russia. At 7.27 on the 2nd of March 1991, an unidentified target appeared on the radar screens at St. Petersburg's Pulkovo Airport. The radar report showed that some 50 miles away, a target was making very fast, chaotic movements over a particular area, a sensitive area, in the town of Sosnovy Bor, namely Leningrad Nuclear Power Plant. And of course, in many case files in America and across the world, these UFOs are seen in and around nuclear power areas, whether it be nuclear missile silo facilities or nuclear power plants. The strange incident was not reported to the media at the time, and was instead investigated several months later by Nikolai Lebedev, the engineer and aeronautics specialist son of a Russian Air Force pilot who worked as a journalist for the St. Petersburg Evening Paper. So let's see what the investigative journalist was able to dig up. After receiving a tip-off about the incident, he was able to get in touch with the engineer who worked with the radar at the airport. What he supposedly told Lebedev was shocking. Not only was the object unable to be identified, it was not, for example, an airliner, it was observed visibly from the airport's control tower. It was described as being large and star-like. Which, admittedly, large and star-like isn't exactly a uh, great description of an object, is it? Not very detailed, for sure. About an hour later, at 8.32 p.m., the radar recorded that the object moved at a phenomenal speed, 3,154 kilometers per hour. So what is that in miles per hour? Is that like really fast? The equivalent of almost 2,000 miles per hour. That seems pretty fast to be making chaotic and erratic movements like was reported by the radar operator. By comparison, the speed of sound is some 767 miles per hour, meaning that the unknown object was recorded as having traveled 2.6 times the speed of sound in the early 1990s. Which, as wild and fast and crazy as that sounds, the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird reached the speed of 2,193 miles an hour in 1976, July 28th, 1976. So it is not unheard of to go that speed. What is unheard of is to make maneuvers, erratic, chaotic maneuvers at that speed. Maneuvers that would literally squash a human. Because remember, these speed records are set going straight, not straight and suddenly turning or straight and going up. These are set going straight ahead as fast as they can. So it doesn't even match the erratic behavior on the radar. Now, this is 20 years after the SR-71, so there's no telling what the secret programs have got, but no country has ever stepped up and said, hey, this was us either. His interest peaked, Lebedev went on to meet with a senior military officer, Captain A.P. Alexev, who told him that, on the same night of the radar report, his unit had received a report of a visual UFO sighting over Sosnovy Bor. According to the report, the light emitted by the object was so strong that it was impossible to make out a precise shape or to identify what it was. 
Though, again, the description is not very detailed at all, it is interesting that the report comes in at the exact same time that it's being reported elsewhere. So it may very well be the same object, but again, with very little detail, there's not much to go on in this case file so far, is it? In the course of his research, Lebedev also claimed to have been told that the Air Defense Command of the Leningrad military were notified of the radar event, as were the area's branch of the KGB. The radar technology was examined, with the designers explicitly ruling out any possibility of malfunction having caused a glitch on the system. The object had been there, and had been seen by several eyewitnesses. In my opinion, both ground-based eyewitnesses and radar both seeing something that is strange at the exact same time is most likely seeing the exact same thing. So I could definitely rule out radar when you have on-ground witnesses verifying their radar readings. Some days later, on the 18th of March, the object was seen again on the airport's radar, this time above the atomic research reactor on the outskirts of Gachina. And that is twice tonight that we've heard about these UFOs over nuclear power plants in Russia. Now to count the amount of case files that we've heard from America with the exact same detail. The fact that they are very interested in what we're doing with nuclear power. Kind of like, hey guys, watch out, the kids have found the matches. <laughs> Visible on the radar for around 20 minutes, it departed at a speed of 2,243 kilometers an hour. Which, once again, is possible. However, what happened next was next to impossible. Later in the year, on the 10th of October, the object returned to Snovsnivibor and was registered on the radar as having begun to move from a stationary position and without acceleration at a speed of 1,800 kilometers per hour. No known terrestrial aircraft or spacecraft would have been capable of performing such a maneuver at the time. As such, there was no explanation for the object that was being reported. And I'm not entirely sure anything in the American arsenal to this day could go from instant to, or from stationary to instantly a thousand kilometers an hour. Uh, which is really, really fast. Eerily, around the time of the sightings, both the nuclear power plant at Sosnovy Bor and the atomic research reactor at Gachina suffered potentially disastrous incidents. For example, a few months after the reports of 1991, in March 1992, the Leningrad plant leaked radioactive gases and iodine into the air through a ruptured fuel channel. Were these dangerous incidents coincidental? Or were they somehow related to the unidentified fast-flying objects that were reported in the area? In my opinion, if they are related, then I believe it would have been the aliens kind of understanding that something may occur because of knowing the faultiness of the lines much more uh, than the actual workers would have. Uh, assuming they have a technology that they could have used to see such a thing. So perhaps they were here kind of as a watch and warning more so than causing it. But then again, who knows? When discussing unidentified flying objects, a question that is often asked is, if these UFOs are piloted by extraterrestrials, why have these beings not made contact? Although officialdom says that these beings have never made contact, there's a lot of abductees and contactees who would absolutely disagree with that statement, right? Well, Russia has a story all its own. In the 1980s, Lieutenant General Georgi Bergovi, a highly decorated military pilot and cosmonaut on the 1968 Soyuz 3 spaceflight mission, presented to a crowd of 200 party leaders, scientists, experts, and members of the official UFO study commission, a report detailing an alien encounter that supposedly took place over a period of four days. So you could say his story is basically sworn testimony. The incident is said to have happened on the Salyut 6 space station, whilst it was in orbit between the 14th and 18th of May 1981. The story goes that at first two cosmonauts on board witnessed a UFO at a distance of half a mile from the station. Then it moved and approached to be at a distance of 100 feet. 
From this distance, the cosmonauts claimed that they were able to see three extraterrestrial life forms inside the ship. According to the cosmonauts' testimonies which were presented in the report, the beings that they saw had brown skin and slanted bright blue eyes. These aliens were also said to have had straight noses and bushy eyebrows. Now, this is an alien race that I have never heard described before, so this is a little bit different than your normal alien encounter, right? The cosmonauts described them as resembling mechanical robots, due to their seemingly emotionless facial expressions. And that is a popular theory for uh, colonizing the universe instead of sending out biological life to send out robotic life and start colonization from there, or even exploration for that matter. The spacecraft itself was also described in detail, and was said to have been spherical, around 30 feet in diameter, with 8 windows and 16 bright spheres arranged around the hull. It was said that the alien craft would vanish and then return. The cosmonauts could not figure out how the strange craft moved, as it had no exhaust pipes or any recognizable instrument to induce propulsion. And as you know, if you've listened to this show for any amount of time, uh, that most UFO cases, the closer encounter ones, uh, have described that exact same thing. The propulsion system is unlike anything that would match something we would do here on Earth. There was no visible uh, ability for thrust or propulsion, yet they were able to accomplish just that, at extremely high speeds nonetheless. At the time of the sightings, the cosmonauts requested that they be allowed to initiate close contact with the craft and the beings that they were seeing. Soviet spaceflight control, however, is reported to have refused their request, and stated that they were to communicate through the use of measuring devices only. The alien ship soon after is reported to have approached the Soviets, and through a porthole, the aliens are said to have shown them a map, on which the cosmonauts were able to identify the solar system, but not the other stars within it. Cosmonauts then attempted to communicate via Morse code, but the aliens showed no reaction. They then attempted to show them mathematical symbols, to which the aliens responded with symbols of their own, which the cosmonauts interpreted as mathematical formulas. It is claimed that this encounter was entirely recorded on video, and was shown by Beregovi to those gathered at the conference in the 1980s. The film is now believed to be housed in a top-secret archive, with some UFO researchers having come forward claiming to have been warned against trying to find the film. And to the best of my knowledge, this film is not available online. Admittedly, such an encounter sounds ludicrous, but the alleged involvement of reliable witnesses and figures such as Beregovi and other cosmonauts makes it difficult to dismiss. That's just as well as the many astronauts we've sent up who have also come back with UFO reports like Mr. Edgar Mitchell, for instance. Not only that, this is not the only extraterrestrial encounter reported by cosmonauts during the Soviet era. According to rumors, each landing of the Soyuz-type spacecraft on their return to Earth was monitored by extraterrestrials. And I have heard that claim made about American spacecraft, too. In October 1991, a Russian newspaper reported on a UFO having been witnessed before the most recent Soyuz spaceship was due to land. In the newspaper article, it was stated that, as previously, the arrival of the UFO was seen by many eyewitnesses, and it was registered by the local Department of Internal Affairs. The use of the word previously indicates that this had happened before and that extraterrestrial observation of human affairs was by then a routine occurrence. What I love is the similarities, generally speaking, of the case files that we get out of Russia and the similarities of the case files that we get out of America and how they both match together. It shows there is one phenomenon going on across the entire world. Whatever that phenomenon may be, whether it's alien or the governments of the world who have found advanced technology and reverse engineered it, and it's just us and alien craft, or maybe they're using Project Bluebeam, right? And maybe it's all just uh, 
uh, holographic simulation. Although in the earlier times, like the 80s and prior, I doubt that. But who knows? The military industrial complex much bigger than we give it credit for, right? But what do you guys think? Do you think Russia has had a interesting amount of case files? Do you think they're all real? Or do you think it could just be more of a Russian hoax and disinformation? In the end, ladies and gentlemen, all you can do is look at the evidence, apply a little common sense, and you be the judge. We got to close it out. That's right, that's it for this episode of the Dark Wolf Stint Show for Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. Nah. Happy Cinco de Mayo, everybody. I hope you guys have enjoyed this show. I know. I really have enjoyed doing it for you guys. It's incredible to me that I found Russian case files. It's the first time I've ran across these. So, needless to say, I was kind of like a kid at Christmas, right? <laughs> Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, though this kid may be closing the deal tonight, don't you worry. The weekend fun has only just begun. That's right. Tomorrow night, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you come back for another brand new episode of the Dark Wolf Stin Show. That's right. Tomorrow night, we're going to be discussing alien abduction phenomena. That's right. Carrying this conversation on from the UFO sightings in Russia to the actual alien abductions going on across the world. We're going to dig into all that more tomorrow, May 6th, 2021. 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, right here on Rippin' Common Sense Radio Network. Then on Friday, May 7th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, our buddy AJ the Rippin' Rabbit will be back with an all-new episode of the Rippin' Rabbit Hole Live Show. That's right. On Friday, he's going to be talking about anticipation. That's right. I'm kind of anticipating this show, right? This is one of the emotions, of course, with the emotional series, I'm sure. Uh, Anticipation and anticipating what could come is a bad thing or a good thing. Could it be uh, a problem with anxiety or could it be good to be anticipatory of exciting events? I'm sure he'll touch on all that more on Friday. May 7th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. And then he's going to follow that up on Saturday, May 8th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, when he's going to jump back on the airwaves again with an all-new episode, again, of the Rippin' Rabbit Hole Live Show. That's right, he's going to be talking about small towns. On this road trip that he's on, he's, I'm sure, passed through quite a few many small towns, and I can't wait to hear the report and the update he's going to give us on Saturday, May 8th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. That's right. Then he's going to round out the weekend right on Sunday, May 9th, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. Turns out he gets a holiday on this weekend. Also, we both got holidays this weekend. How you like that? He's going to get a very special holiday. Mother's Day is coming up. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, May 9th. 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, under Rippin' Rabbit Hole and Rippin' Common Sense Radio. That's right, he's going to be talking about the celebration of mothers, Mr. AJ the Rippin' Rabbit is, and I hope everybody joins in for that amazing, special, and wonderful celebration of the most important women in our lives. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go over to the therippinrabbithole.com What's that? Well, that's my favorite hangout. I love to hop on over there or pounce on over there, if it, as it were, and hang out with the rest of my rabbit friends over in the Backstage 24-7 Lounge, one of my favorite hangouts. That's where I'm going to be right after this show. And if you would like to join me, it's really easy to do. Check this out, guys. All you got to do is go to the RippinRabbitHole.com. That is R-I-P-O-N-R-A-B-B-I-T-H-O-L-E 
Bowl.com. That's right. Over there, you're going to sign up for the 24 or for the backstage pass. That's going to allow you access to the 24/7 backstage lounge, as well as a variety of other amazing, fun things on the site, like our social media network, exclusive to the Riffin Rabbit Hole.com over there, as well as our groups section and the many variety of different uh, things in the group section from lucid dreaming and uh, different varieties of paranormal topics to uh, the Riffin' Rabbit Hole players and a number of other fun stuff. And in my own group over there, the Dark Wolf's Din Show, of course, make sure you drop by there and drop us a line. That's right. I'm going to go on over, like I said, to the Riffin' Rabbit Hole uh, dot com and the 24-7 backstage lounge. It's my honor and pleasure to talk to you guys every week. I can't believe I get this. We're almost a year so far. So on behalf of our amazing mod team over on YouTube, uh, on behalf of AJ the Riffin Rabbit, Walt House, Chick Mandela Effect, Michael Musco, everybody that's been involved with this show, and Tom Bayless, of course, for this amazingly funky music we're listening to right now. Shout out to Red Shed Studios, Mr. Tom Bayless. If you're looking for custom work, make sure you give him a call number in the YouTube description box down below our video. On that, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all these amazing folks, my name is Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, stay awake but dare to dream. Come on, Tom. Let's get out of here, buddy. Good night, everybody. How? Yeah. That's right. Things are better, better left unknown And I'll never find you here Cause no one's ever, no one's ever Just illusion I'm lost in a world